good. Okay then. Okay, you've got to pray. You've got to pray. You've got to pray. <laughs> well, they, whatever time you're going to take it next, I'll, I'll come join you with it. You've got to pray. Yeah, you got to pray. That's a Baba Tindi or, or Francis. You got to. Okay, guys. <laughs> guys, let me start. Though. I don't, where's Olati now? <laughs> hey, Olati. Oh. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Which Olati is that like? Ah, you just want like, that's good for us. <laughs> ah, it's good for us. It's, I need Olati so that she and I can agree the time I started. Because Olati might tell me you started for 30. You're a little bit, uh, let, Let's go for it. I don't know. Do you have guys in the foyer? If there was Bissola around now, I would have told Bissola to harass all of them. They're not. Okay. I'm going to start. <clears throat> Whose clock am I using? Baba Tende. So, Baba Tende. I'm good to go, right? Huh? 36 or 7. 36. Okay. Okay, then let's agree in prayer. Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus, we do lend our spirits to the spirit of a living God within us. That out through the vessel of our being, you pour forth your wisdom with mighty clarity. Father, we do thank you for we have wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of that spirit that you've so richly given to us in redemption. Father, we believe and receive that the burden of ignorance is dematerialized to your glory. Everybody says, Amen. Well, let's go for the last session today. Uh, you want to come with me to... Uh, let me just show you something. Let's read something in Colossians. 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 Colossians and chapter 1. Yeah. Colossians and chapter 1. <clears throat> okay. If you, in fact, before I do Colossians, let's just quickly dovetail into something we were saying before. And then we go. Acts 11. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. And then you go all the way. Acts 11. You go all the way to verse 5. Peter. Remember I read verse 1. Verse 2. And verse 3. Okay. If you look at verse 4. But Peter. 11, Acts 11 verse 4. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them saying verse 5 i was in the city of joppa praying what was he doing praying i was in the city of joppa praying and in a trance i saw a vision hallelujah you see he was praying and in a trance i saw a vision now that tells you something that prayer is a vehicle for supernatural adventures so, because he was praying, and in a prayer, he trans in a trans a vision. It says, a certain vessel uh, descended as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. The point I want you to see is that, how did Peter get to a point where he was ready to go to the house of Cornelius? He was praying. It says, I was in the city of Joppa praying. Then if you go to Acts 10 and verse 31, it says, and said, uh, or verse 30, and Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. 
And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. So Cornelius is praying. Your prayer is heard and your arms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. So Cornelius' prayer prepared Cornelius like Peter's prayer prepared Peter. Right? If you go down to verse 27, it says, And as he talked with him, he went in and found, so look at verse 26, Peter, Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also, I am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. So the prayer of Cornelius helped Cornelius to prepare many people to receive the ministry of Peter. Yeah. So I want you to see the effect. So Cornelius was, was praying. And in the praying, he organized people to come around to wait for Peter's message. Look at Acts 10 and verse 44. While, Acts 10, 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Now, watch carefully. Notice, if you had asked Peter, have you finished preaching? He would have said no. Peter was still preaching. And in the midst of his preaching, there was a spontaneous outflowing of the Spirit of God. What is going on there? The congregation had prayed. Cornelius, the, yeah, who was the congregation, had prayed. And he was ready. To the extent that he had prepared many other people to come receive from Peter. And then Peter, the minister, had also come from a place of prayer. So both the minister and the audience had been prepared in prayer. And as a result, there was a spontaneous flow. Right? Reception on the part of the audience was enhanced. And utterance on the part of the preacher was enhanced. So that when the reception and the utterance met together, there was an ease in the operations of God in that meeting. Right? There's something to learn there. Now, the other thing I want you to see is this. If you go to verse Acts 11 and verse 5, what was Peter doing? I was in the city of Joppa praying. Now, what did that prayer help uh, Peter with? Number one, it helped his readiness to go. Because we know that Peter was not exactly at the, in a place in doctrine where he was going to follow what the Lord said. So the prayer helped him in his readiness. Right? The prayer helped him. Why? The distractions he will have felt from uh, was not as strong because he was giving himself to prayer. So he went. The other thing that the prayer did for uh, Peter was that he prepared him for the opposition that was coming. Yeah, the prayer prepared him for the opposition that was coming so that when the opposition came, he faced it correctly. He was able to, let's say it again differently. I've said it at different times. That Jesus, in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, he continued in prayer. And from the prayer, he chose 12 disciples. Or from 12 disciples, he chose apostles. But the apostles that he chose were not exactly the most perfect of men. They still acted towards him in ways that were substandard. But what Jesus' prayer life guaranteed was that he was steady for them. So, in our relationships, as we pray for people, we are a steady and a safe hand for people. So, we are steady for them, although they might not be what they ought to be for us. But it means that my relationships can be guided and guarded rightly. Okay? In other words, when I pray for a person, it does not guarantee that that person will change at the rate, at the pace, at the time that I expect the person to change. But my praying actually, my involving myself in praying for others does something to my heart as I relate to people. I am able to give myself more easily to tenderness and to kindness. Okay? So my prayer for others is for their good, but happens to do me good because it's based on love. It steadies me. Okay? Now, so in other words, as uh, Acts 11:5, Peter was praying, but Peter's prayer 
it, right? Actually steadied Peter so that when all of the accusations started flying around in Acts 11, he was steady enough. Look at uh, verse, uh, verse 4. But Peter, uh, in fact, if you look at uh, verse 2, and when Peter was come to the Jerusalem, they that were of a circumcision contended. So it wasn't a friendly meeting. They were contending with him. There was contention. How did Peter respond? Look at verse 4. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded. So what Peter was going to expound was no new facts to him. He already had the parts. But Peter being in a safe, sane place, where he's not going to respond to contention with contention, was that he had been prepared in prayer for what lay ahead. Yeah. So in our notice, it was engagement. So Peter engaging Cornelius, enhanced, uh, uh, prepared by his prayer. Peter engaging other people, or like other fellow ministers, enhanced by his prayer. So that what he, the prayer did not give him new knowledge. It did not give him anything new, but it steadied him so that what he had to minister to them, he could minister rather than get distracted by contention. Right? So that's very, in other words, prayer that is based on the love of God, on the revelation or revelation of redemption, actually leaves us in optimal uh, position to minister to those we are meant to minister to. We are optimally ready for them. Right? We are optimally ready for them, if, uh, even if the circumstances are not the best. Look at Colossians. Colossians. Colossians and uh, chapter, Colossians and chapter 1. Look at Colossians 1. I wonder to see something. Colossians and chapter 1. Colossians and chapter 1. The greatest effect that prayer has is on people. Right? The greatest effect of prayer is on people. And it is felt most strongly in relationships. Colossians and chapter 1. And you go all the way to verse 7. Paul is talking. He says, as you, that's the uh, Colossians, also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow, what? Servant. So Epaphras is a servant, like Paul is a servant. Notice, so we're talking about Epaphras' ministry. So it says here, who is for you a faithful minister? So it's ministry, right? So his service is talking about his ministry. Who is for you a faithful, what? Minister of Christ. So notice in verse 7, where did the Colossians learn the gospel from? When Epaphras, he said, as you also learned, it is stated that Paul never met the Colossians face to face. So Epaphras, a disciple of Paul, went to Colossae, stayed in Colossae, uh, preached to the Colossians, stayed there, became their pastor, groomed them, and Paul never met them. But they were still strong, strong solid believers. Epaphras was their minister, a good student of Paul, but then a faithful minister to these people. Now, so, but if you then look at Colossians 4, so notice Epaphras, they learned from Epaphras. That will make Epaphras a teacher, right? A teacher, preacher, pastor. Now, then look at Colossians and chapter 4. Colossians 4, and we go all the way to verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ. He was called fellow servant in Colossians 1, 7. He's now called a servant of Christ. So the dominant thing that stood out about, uh, about uh, Epaphras was his heart of service. It says, it says here, uh, it says, a servant of Christ saluted you. Notice what the servant of Christ is now doing. The servant of Christ in a, a, a Colossians 1 had taught them. Now the servant of Christ that had taught them is now praying for them. Look at Colossians 4 and verse 12. A servant of Christ saluted you, always laboring fervently. Notice the service was a labor. It was a fervent labor for you in prayers. So the prayer of Epaphras was a continuation of his ministry to the people he had taught. Right? So always laboring fervently for you in prayers. In other words, it is not enough for you to have a disciple that you teach. You must labor in prayer for the disciple. Somebody says, but I've taught you, so why don't you get it? There does something about following the ministry of the word with prayer, right? Because prayer can be a phenomenal help. So it says here, it says, Epaphras, Colossians 4, 12, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salutes you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. That you watch, what is the, look, look at the prayer. So, because it's one thing to say somebody is praying, it's another thing to know what the prayer focuses. What is this, what is he laboring in prayer about? 
that you may stand perfect and complete in all what? The will of God. What is this will of God? Go down to verse 17 and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that you do what? Fulfill it. So in order for Archippus to fulfill the ministry that he has, uh, let me put it differently. Epaphras, listen well, Epaphras has been praying, laboring. He's been praying as a servant of Christ. He's been praying fervently, very likely in the spirit for these guys. Paul now comes and on the basis of Epaphras' prayer for them, he effectively gives an interpretation or consequence of Epaphras' labor in prayer. And it says, on account of Epaphras' prayer, say to Archippus, now fulfill ministry. In other words, the will of God that Epaphras was praying about for the Colossians was ministry for them all to stand in and fulfill. So the will of God is that the ministers that pray, their prayer produces more ministers that will actively go forth to do ministry. So praying in the light of redemption multiplies ministries. It multiplies the men that will take up the ministry that they've already received. Look at it again. Colossians 4, 17. So if you take Paul's instruction as the interpretation or consequence of Epaphras' prayer, then the link between Epaphras' labor uh, and what is going to happen to the saints is that in the will of God, they will now begin to tell Archippus. So their words to Archippus would be, Archippus, you have a ministry, you have a ministry, you've received the ministry, do something about it. Right? So apparently, telling somebody to do something about ministry is not merely a thing of what I told you. There is, a, there is a laboring for that person that must precede it so that the person will be ready and will be optimally available to do something about the ministry when he's told about it. Notice, when did Archippus receive the ministry? Way before Epaphras was praying. Say to Archippus, verse 17, take heed. Now pay attention to the ministry which you have received in the Lord. Where did Archippus receive it? In the Lord. Was Archippus in possession of it or was still far away from him? No, he was in possession of it. Was Archippus doing anything about that ministry? No. What was the will of God? That the saints around Archippus will all with one voice be telling Archippus the same thing about the ministry that he had so that Archippus could now fulfill it. So in order for people to fulfill ministry in the church, prayer has to go ahead of them. It's not merely that the person has knowledge or that the person even knows that he has a ministry. There is a gap, a distance between a man knowing he has ministry that he has received and a man properly doing it. In order for the man to properly do it, prayer, intense prayer, yeah, labor, prayer as labor, fervent prayer has to go ahead of it. Yeah, so in other words, the, the result of uh, Epaphras prayer in the church will be that there will be more people like Epaphras. More that will awaken to ministry. Amen. Always, so in other words, uh, the, the prayer of, uh, uh, of Epaphras for the saints will produce more Epaphrases. How does God multiply ministers in the churches is by the prayers of the members of the churches. Let me tell you this, something funny. You see, if a local church prays concerning its own members, the prayer of that local church will always be more effective than the prayer prayed for that same church from afar. Go back to Colossians 4.12. Look at it again. Colossians 4.12. Epaphras, who is what? Epaphras, who is one of you? How is he one of them? The one that taught them. Right? He says he does something. He salutes you. Always laboring fervently for you. So the effect that a Epaphras prayer will have on Archippus is far more optimal and efficient than any other prayer prayed any other place. <laughs> Do you understand? Right? Uh, because people that fellowship together are able to influence each other better. Let me say it again. If I stay in Russia and I pray for you in Japan, I, I will not be as effective as if I was around you in, in Japan to pray for you. Because I will be a witness to you of the prayer you will see in me the example of what 
I'm praying about, and you will therefore go faster. Did you understand? Yeah? So, uh, if, if I stay here, and I pray for you, uh, they, uh, and you are not, if you are around me, so in other words, people are better enhanced or influenced in prayer by good examples. Hallelujah. Yeah? When pe- let me say it again. Prayer in a vacuum without godly examples produces slow progress. But prayer, where the solid example moves faster. Prayer by people that are the examples works best. Yeah? Prayer by people that are, in other words, the prayer you will pray for your own disciple will be eff- more effective than the prayer anybody could pray for that person. Yeah? <laughs> right? In other words, that's quite interesting. It implies there's priority in prayer. Did you get that point? So Jesus will say, I pray not for the whole world, but I pray for them. Why? He's ministering to them. They've been around him. They've been influenced by him. Right? So he says, I pray for them. He will tell uh, Paul, Peter, the Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you. Why? Peter is in the immediate vicinity of Jesus, and in the example of Jesus, she, he has the, uh, uh, the example he needs to learn how to walk out of whatever is in front of him. So, what does Jesus do for the Peter that is praying for? He will take him to prayer. Amen. Right? So, if Peter, listen carefully, Jesus praying for Peter, and Peter actually praying, which one has maximum impact? Peter, who is being prayed for, if he prays himself. So, why did Peter end up betraying Jesus, although Jesus prayed for him? Because when Jesus took him to prayer, he would him pray. So, Peter will use his prayer to receive the consequence of Jesus' prayer, so to produce maximum effect. That was a whole lot. Is that obvious? Is that clear? Let me say one more time. Jesus did not fail. It is just that, let me say it again, the person that is able to show you an example, if the person prays for you, there will be more impactful praying than if a person who cannot be an example to you prays for you. So, for example, I will have a better result praying for grace place people than I will have praying for somebody who is pastored by somebody else. Because it, they will be influenced by the examples they are exposed to. So, Paul will pray for the people he's preaching to because an example for them. Paul will not say, I'm praying for the people pastored by Peter. Do you understand? Right? Amen. Following? Yeah? It's not because he doesn't love, but now we're getting into praying intelligently intelligently so now jesus would tell peter satan has asked to save you i have prayed for you he would then take peter to prayer and he would tell peter pray that you enter not into temptation what temptation the very one that pray for you about but how will peter receive the influence of paul's prayer peter uh, jesus's prayer for him it is by he himself entering into prayer amen if i pray for a person and the person gives himself to prayer, the prayer works faster. If I pray for a person who is not given to prayer, it works slower. If I pray for a person and I'm an example to the person, more effective than if I'm not an example to the person. Is that right? Anyway, Colossians 4 and verse uh, 12. Epaphras, who is one of you? A servant of Christ. They know him. They know Epaphras. Because in verse chapter 1 verse 7, he has said you learned from Epaphras. That means you're already allowing yourself to be influenced by Epaphras. So therefore, he's now telling them that I am, he's praying for you. Notice, did Paul pray for the Colossians? Yes. But the one he emphasizes to them is Epaphras' prayer. Yeah, look at it. Colossians 1. Look at Colossians 1. Colossians 1 and verse uh, 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ and of the love which you have to all the, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, we are off, we are, now, I'm going to have to skip now. Look at verse 7. As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful servant of Christ, who also declared to us your love, then, like I said, read the, in the spirit with the next verse, in the spirit. For this cause, we also, that means Paul and his crew, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire, watch his prayer, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. That will, Epaphras is now going to pray about. It will now big up Epaphras' prayer for them because that's where they will be affected. Is that clear? So Colossians 4, 
So, did Paul pray different from Epaphras? No. He was praying about the will of God. That will of God, he would now explain it thoroughly in Epaphras. The way he described Epaphras' prayer is because Epaphras is a man that their heart will open to better than their heart will open to Paul. Paul to them is that distant big man apostle somewhere praying for us. Epaphras, one of you, our own, our person. We know him. We know Epaphras. Epaphras loves us, we know. Paul, there are many of people under him. We don't know when he has our attention of our church. But Epaphras is ours. Let me tell you again. Amen. Colossians 4, 12. Epaphras, who is one of you? A servant of Christ. Salute you. So why? He's appealing to their heart. <laughs> This guy is greeting you, your, you know, your own Epaphras, your own faithful minister, our own fellow laborer, right? He says, uh, uh, salutes you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Now, he now says exactly what he's praying for them too, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. He now says in verse 13, I bear him record. Why is he bearing Epaphras record? Because that's when we walk first faster. Did you see? I bear him record. Why? They already learned from him. Right? So, uh, 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 they already learned from him. If you go to, I'm coming. Um, um, look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 1. Colossians 2 1. For I would that you knew what great, what? Conflict. I have for, that's the Colossians, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So, they had not seen Paul's face in the flesh. But he's saying, I have great conflict for you. It appears that in the Bible, the people that pray for a person, they do a better job in prayer by letting the person know. So, Jesus will tell Peter, I have prayed for you. Paul will tell the Ephesians, I have prayed for you. He will tell the Philippians, I am praying for you. He, uh, Paul will tell the Colossians, I am praying for you. So, praying in the secret in a corner... Right? It doesn't work as best as when you let the person you are praying for know that you are praying. Why? The heart of the person opens up to you because you care. And then they can be influenced. Man is a product of influence. And so, when you tell a person, I've been praying for you, I've been laboring for the last three years. Imagine somebody calls you and says, you know what? You've been on my mind for the last two years. And every day, without fail, for the last two years, I've been praying for you. And the person now says, how are you? You will talk, oh. You will talk. Even if you're a quiet person, you will talk. You'll be like, for the last two years, oh. Ah. Like you don't find yourself saying, hey, ah, like two weeks. So if the person now says, you know, two weeks ago, I was just in some sort of a groan. You will say, ah, ah. That was when, you start talking. That was, that was when, that was, you start talking. You got your heart is opening up. You, you start opening up. Anyway, Colossians 4, verse 12. Epaphras, it says in verse 13, for I bear him record. That he has a great zeal. So, what is, what is involved in prayer? Desire, fervency, zeal. Zeal. Desire, fervency, labor. Who supplies the labor? Man. Fervency, man. Zeal, man. A result of the word of God anyway. It's a result of the word of God. My cooperation, because of the revelation of Jesus, is to supply zeal in prayer. So, somebody says, I like the way that person, uh, uh, let me give you an example. Have you, if you come for prayer meeting, have you seen the way Tunde prays? There's doubt that Tunde who doesn't sing. Yeah, who doesn't, he, he sings so well, we don't, you know, so you know that, yeah, yeah, no. yeah, yeah, okay. You, 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 you watched him pray before. He's doing like machine gun and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that is not an anointing, though. That is zeal, right? That is what, so what do you do? When you come for prayer meeting, you don't close your eyes when the people are praying. You watch. Because what you, what you give attention to, you'll be influenced by. Yeah? So if you can, you stay around the person, you pray around him. Whatever it is. Yeah? Why? Because that zeal is contagious. Amen. Yeah? Now, so it says, yeah, I bear him record. That means somebody says, no, my zeal is spiritual. It's inward. It's an inward zeal. Uh, when it's real, it is, it's, somebody else can say, I bear you record. Amen? In prayer. Notice, Paul, Paul was the kind of person 
that when he sees good prayer, he will mention it. He said, I bear him record. But why, why is Paul doing that? He wants them to be open to receive the ministry of their pastor who is praying for them. Amen. Okay, so he says again. So, for I bear him record, Colossians 4, 13, that he has a great zeal for you. And them that are in where? Laodicea. My dear friends, can I have your attention? How did Paul know that Epaphras had great zeal? He saw him pray. And they would have talked about it. You know prayer is something we should talk about. Something, yeah. Our experiences in prayer. Our compassion in prayer. The things laid on our hearts. That is the way to have an effective prayer life. You should have people, you know, have, you know, someone like, uh, you have people at like December 26, you're like, I've been watching that stiletto, and you discuss about the shoe. Then after the shoe, you discuss about the zeal. Not the zeal to buy the shoe, but the zeal of that other zeal. Nothing wrong with the shoe, sincerely. Amen. i rather a girl was beautiful and uh, whatever. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. But I'm saying Add to your zeal, to your knowledge, zeal rather. Add to your knowledge, zeal. Let knowledge lead to zeal. We should be zealous about those things. So it says here, I bear him record that he had a great, not it, see, it was enough to say he had zeal. He said great zeal. Look at the language that Paul is using. You almost think Paul is actually idolizing uh, Epaphras. A servant of Christ. Yeah. Always laboring fervently for you. When it comes to his own prayer for the same Colossians, he doesn't talk about it that much. He, mention, he just mentions it. But he knows they already received from a purpose. Amen. You know, if you want to change a person, you can tell him, you know, that somebody that you know he likes or that likes him, just say, that person is praying for you. <laughs> yeah? Why? It opens the heart. Man is changed from the heart. The parable of the sower shows that man is changed from the heart. And whatever a man's heart can be open to can transform the man. What is Paul doing here? He's maximizing that impact. Talking to them about Epaphras. So they now start looking at him like, eh. Hey. So Epaphras, ah, you are labor for us in zeal. Ah, bro. Daddy pastor. Now, so he says, <laughs> verse 13, and I bear him record that he has a great zeal for you and them that are where? In Laodicea and them in Erapolis. You notice that, anyway, don't let me go into all that. Laodicea and Colossia have happened to be mentioned a lot together. So there must be something about those two assemblies. Anyway, move on. Now he now says in verse 17, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry. So that ministry, imagine. So Paul has written the book of Colossians so that he can get the old church to agree with him that Archippus ought to do something about his ministry. But to get them to agree, he tells them about the prayer life of a particular one amongst them. And says that person has been praying. So almost like on the authority of that man's prayer, who you know loves you with his great zeal, all of you go and say this to Archippus. All of them will be able to say it. You know, sometimes you say things to people and then you say it again. And when you say it, you say it from prayer. Somehow that works. Better still, when you are speaking from prayer, then let the person know I've been praying. Why? You are simply saying I love you. Right? I care. And if somebody knows you care, nobody's immune to being loved. Someone say, hey, don't like me, don't like me. Don't love me. I don't like to be liked. No, no, there are very few human beings that are that way. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, mm, you know, it's like this. Deola is the only person I know that if they buy a shoe for you, like a shoe care. No, no, don't, don't buy. No. You see? It's an oxymoron. It's an oxymoron. It's an hyperbole and oxymoron. <laughs> no. Yeah, so very, very important. Look at Ephesians. I want you to see something in Ephesians too. Ephesians. Ephesians and chapter 1. It says in verse, uh, verse 15, Ephesians 1 15, wherefore I also, after I heard of your, I heard of your what? Faith in the Lord Jesus and your love unto all the saints, I cease not to give thanks. Why is he telling them? It's a pattern. Why does Jesus tell Peter? Why does, uh, he tell, why does Paul tell the Colossians? Why does he tell the Ephesians? Right? So it says here, it says, uh, it's because of this. Prayer is not magical. You see, 
for a while. I've dealt with prayer as just general with respect to the world. We are zoning in on prayer in the local church. Prayer is not magical. For prayer to have its maximum impact, a saint needs to know that he's being prayed for. Because prayer is meant to be the practice of love. The heart of a man opens up to whoever loves him. So, it says here in verse 16 of Ephesians 1, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. He now tells them what he's praying. So, you notice, they do two things. Notice the prayer of Jesus for Peter. He tells him what the issue is. Notice the prayer of Epaphras for the Colossians. He tells, he tells them the emphasis of, of his prayer. Notice the prayer of Paul for the Ephesians. Prayer, he, doesn't, he just does not say, I'm praying for you. He says, Satan has asked to sift you. I prayed for you that your faith fail not. So, why? Because instructions will follow the prayer that will help the person you are praying for reap the answer. Let me say that one more time. Instructions will follow the prayer. You see, when a person is praying for you, instructions are easy to receive from the person. And then, or, or, funny enough, the person might have instructions. You should not ignore. Amen. Are you there? You know, we're talking about ministry now. Right? So, it says here... Uh, Look at what Paul does. All those prayers were called the Pauline prayers. Do you know he wasn't praying it for himself? He was praying it for people. And he will now tell them the content of the prayer. Why? It's because of the mind of man. They have a mind. Let me tell you. Let's say I'm praying for you now. And I pray for you in tongues. I would do a better job if I tell you the interpretation of a tongue when I said I pray for you. Because then your mind has something to lay hold of, to steady you, and for you to gravitate towards. Let me say that one more time. Amen. Am I going too fast? Okay. Now, so, if I pray, look at Paul's prayer. Paul prayers for the Ephesians. <laughs> Think about this carefully. This prayer, he now tells them the content. It doesn't just say, look, many of us will have stopped at verse 16. At least, I, I want you to know I'm praying for you. Finish that. But that's not Paul. It says, he now tells them that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fact, because the prayer is a teaching in itself. In the prayer of Paul, or sorry, Epaphras for the Colossians, the Colossians will begin to see, ah, so there should be zeal. This is the kind of thing somebody gives their energy to. And so the man is fervent, he labors. So and why? You see, because the prayer, in, let me say it again. When I pray, to make my point, just go to Matthew 17. Hold on. I'm going to appear to contradict myself, but please listen well, because it is not a contradiction. It's a clarification. Look at Matthew 17. Are you there? Matthew 17, verse 4. Then, oh, verse 3. This is the Mount of Transfiguration. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. That's talking with Jesus. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you will, let us make here what? Three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Now, it says in verse 5, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So, there were supernatural things taking place. They're spectacular even, right? Now, it says... Uh, verse 8, and when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man, save Jesus only. Verse 9, and as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, tell the vision to no man, until the Son of Man be what? Risen again from the dead. Now, listen carefully. So, uh, having, you know, Cornelius said that he was in prayer, and then describe what happened, Right? Uh, Paul, uh, Peter also talked about being in prayer and then described what happened. Now, but here is something to realize. That a person having a spectacular or supernatural operation of the Spirit of God, and the truth is, prayer is for adventures too. Because Peter said, I was praying in a prayer, a trance, and a trance, a vision, and then stop. Right? So, when we pray, there is a triggering of supernatural activity. But, Jesus, had, look at verse 9. Jesus said, Tell the what? So did Jesus know that Peter saw a vision? Yes. Right? In fact, you know what is funny? There were many, look at it, look at verse 9. 
Jesus charged who? Jesus charged who? Can many people have the same vision? Can many people be caught up in the same supernatural encounter? Yes. Right? What did Jesus tell them not to do? Tell nobody. You know why they shouldn't tell anybody? Because until they had the knowledge of the resurrection, they wouldn't know how to deliver what they had experienced. Let me say it again. Yeah? Experiencing things is simply because you are spiritual of the spirit. Explaining them is growth. The, the growth involved in adventure is far less than the growth involved in recounting it. Apparently, recounting or retelling supernatural experience is a teaching in itself. Therefore, in recounting it, you can know a person that is not given to spiritual growth by what they will emphasize in the encounter. I saw an angel. He was 18 feet tall. His shoe was like the one that they wear in... Yeah? And his chest was wide like an arsenal defender. And the perfume was smelling around him. It was like Gucci. You know that person who is talking? Ought not to talk. Yeah, ought not to talk because there's nothing said. Was something, wait, oh, there might have been a smell. I don't even doubt it. But the moment you are talking about what you have seen, you are ministering. The moment you are ministering, your knowledge of the word comes in. If a person's knowledge of the word is deficient, he should talk less. So that kind of person will just be, I'm praying for you. Did you understand what I just said? You just say, I prayed. Don't go into, ah, when I was praying, I saw a keno. This keno just got big. And sir, you began to drown. <laughs> no other person was drowning, just you. <laughs> and then I saw that one man that was drunk in the pub, ran from the pub and rescued you. And then I had a voice that said, Thus have I sent these drunkards to deliver you from all that avails you. So trust in the Lord. You're like, ah. <laughs> I said it that way so it doesn't make sense. Because it doesn't make sense. It ma See, it matters who is trying to explain the content of prayer to you. Notice that in the epistle, it is the apostle that is writing the letter. You, do you know, a, funny enough, it wasn't even a paraphrase that explained his own prayer. And a paraphrase is a knowledgeable man. Are you following? Yeah. Wait. Did Jesus raise a little girl from the dead? What's her name? No, it's not Alita. <laughs> I tricked you. Her name is not Alita. Talita Kumi is Aramaic. It just means damsel or little girl, get up. Okay? We don't really know her name. Well, I don't know. I just tricked you. Don't worry. Now, but here's the point. Did Jesus heal that girl? Raise her from the dead. How do we know? Who is they? No, the student, it was John Mark. Oh. John Mark, a disciple of Peter. That's the same John Mark that was going around the Barnabas and Paul. Who was fit for ministry. He has been around soundness of doctrine. So he could write it. By the time John Mark is writing that Jesus raised that girl, it is years of doctrinal exposure that made him focus on the right things. You know two people can tell you the same miracle and you wonder if they are describing the same thing. Hmm? One person will say, ah, I have paid the price. Oh, 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 oh. Hmm. If you knew my life before, ah, uh ah. -huh. Before it happened. And you're saying, what's it? Yeah. Whereas another person is already taking you into insight about God. Yeah. See the way Mark told the story. Talita Kumi. Not too much. And she was wearing a red dress. We don't care. We shouldn't care. Uh, she was naked. We don't even know. We don't need to. Hey, the girl was at first naked. Why are you telling us? 
Do you understand? Because it takes, it takes spiritual smartness to know what to emphasize and not emphasize. Look at the way that the Bible itself is written, so you get the point. Paul will say that Melchizedek, that he will say Moses made Melchizedek like unto the Son of God. That there were certain things he did not emphasize. And there were other things he emphasized so that his lesson could be learned. The same way too for the, all the people that told us about miracles in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were students of the apostles. It was from being students of the apostles that they recorded what they recorded. So that they were then emphasizing the correct things. Yeah? Damsel, I say to you, arise. The moment after she's risen up, the next thing is, do you have food? Give her to eat. You've learned what you need to learn. That if somebody is risen from the dead and the person is not given food, if the natural is not in place, the person will die again. You would then think that there was no power. But what has happened is just simply that the body is a mortal body. That's all. You see, there's a whole lot of that in that sense. Otherwise, ah, oh, no, it was a... Uh, it was the grandma that first cried. The grandma said, man of God, if you lay hands now, I promise you an elephant and have a cow. You know, all the things are not important. So when I say, I believe it was that elephant and cow. That it, do you think about it? Do you suppose that the family of that girl would, uh, would not have been saying nonsense? Jesus, if you can come and do something, just do something. We'll give you the synagogue. <laughs> then in fact, you know what? We'll kill the high priest for you. But Mark won't write it down because that is just simply irrelevant. But a person not spiritual will be like, mm, it was a word that just came. Before Jesus entered, the person said, I give you my wife. And that was what did it. That God does, does, does some special things. It's a, it's a portal, a realm, a dimension. You know you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in trouble already. Do you know what? Supernatural experience does not equal ability to express it and describe it. Yeah? In fact, it takes spiritual maturity to have seen and to say nothing. At the moment Peter told, the moment Jesus told Peter, don't say, and Peter didn't say, Peter was growing. Because Peter normally would want to talk. Not just Peter, it was all of them. But you know Peter later talked about it. In Second Peter, he said, we had a voice from excellent glory. Yeah, when? By the time he's now talking, the guy is now saying, ah, ah, the spirit of Christ in the prophet was searching. You're like, Peter! <laughs> Why, Peter had grown! You understand? Peter! Amen. But you get the point. What I'm trying to say is this. Although I told you what I said before about telling a person, you yourself, you ought to know, am I a student of the word? If you're not a student of the word, it's enough to say I'm praying for you. I love you. That's enough. Whether you saw a Kano or Keno or Kenu, or you saw a river. Whatever it is you saw, keep it to yourself. Do you understand? Just keep it to yourself. Right? Because it is possible for a person. Imagine when Peter saw the voice say to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter, you know what happened to Peter? Let me show you something. Look at Acts 11. Quickly, come back to Acts 11. Look at Acts 11. I'm just saying what I said to you about uh, the people that give detail in the Bible are students of the world, though. That's why they give detail. Sometimes, all you need to say is, I'm praying for you. And that's enough. It just shows the person you love. Look at Acts 11. Are you there? Acts 11. It says, I'm coming. Um, oh. Verse 14. It says, and as I began to speak, we know the story, that's why I'm jumping in the middle. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the what? Beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord. How that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then. It's not giving an explanation. For as much then, as God gave us the like gift as he gave unto us, who believed the Lord Jesus, who was I that should withstand God? So that means in Acts 10, go back to Acts 10. In Acts 10, when the Bible says in verse 46, for they heard them do what? Speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can anybody do what? Do you know that what Peter is saying that between the, they started speaking in tongues and when he said, can anybody forbid water? He remembered the word of the Lord. 
So that means it was his knowledge of what the Lord taught that guided what he was now going to say to people about what was going on. Did you get the point? Anyway, so go back to Ephesians 1 and verse 11. Ephesians 1. Why, why did everyone say verse 11? Ephesians 1. Uh, it says here in verse 17 or verse 16, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And then he now gives them the detail of the prayer that the God of our Lord Jesus, the Father of glory. Now, if, if you're an Ephesian saint and you are reading this, what are you learning? You are learning about God. It says the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom. That is to say, revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding. Being a, you know, you teach that. We teach this thing. This prayer of his is a teaching. Why did Paul give them that this much, this much detail? Paul has doctrinal balance, soundness, to convey the correct thing. And in conveying the correct thing, he wrote it down, and then we even learn that. Look at it again. He says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may uh, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of the inheritance of the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards all who believe according to the working of many power. But he, he, he did all that. He wrote that much detail to them. Now, uh, in fact, do you know that if, if we want to be, if we want to actually be uh, technical, the prayer of Paul in Ephesians 1 continues in Ephesians 2. You understand? When he says, because he still continues in verse 23, which is his body, the foot, you know it's like a teaching, but he's praying. Right? This, wait, wait. Do you think these are the exact words that Paul prayed? No. Why is Paul writing this? To teach them. So that some things will not be said, some other things will be said, in order that the teaching might be a teaching. Amen. Are you there? Are you there? Okay. Which is his body, the fullness of him that filled all, yeah? And you are the quicken, who are dead in transparency and see. He's teaching them. You can almost not say where did the prayer end, where the teaching begin. Right? Now, that is important for you and I to see. Right? That in the church, when we pray for one another, we tell one another that we are praying for one another. As our understanding of the word of God increases, we put detail that emphasizes the word. No, uh, you don't tell yourself to a mini herbalist and say, uh, <laughs> don't worry, when you just get, I don't, you know what I did? I saw you when I was praying that you first put your left leg through the door on Monday morning. So when you go to, when you go to your office on Monday morning, left leg, just lift it up. You're not far from herbalist. What if you saw the left leg? Keep it to yourself. That one is for you, not for that person. Yeah, <laughs> you won't give instruction from that because at that point in time, you are now making that person regress spiritually. <laughs> Amen. That is too much information that even the speaker does not understand. Hallelujah. But the point I wanted to see is that in praying for one another, we will have we will have things that we will know. Like Jesus, there are things that we will know. You know what you discover? That the believer, the spirit of God that we received in the new creation is a knowing spirit. And the best, the, the best development of our ability to draw from that knowing spirit is to pray for people. You discover that revelation flows the strongest when you are praying for others. Yeah? Yeah? As you pray for a person, you just know. Because that is the direction in which love flows. Amen. All I'm saying is, it is not all you see or sense that you say. Because some of what you see or sense might be things that you yourself need to do something about and it's not for that person to even know. And the person might never need to know. Because all that we tell a person is to the intent that the person be instructed and edified. What somebody will hear and will say, Yeah! You, so if I, you, you the one saying it. You started with the ye. <laughs> Sister, talk about I have something to say. <laughs> I, I, I was praying. <laughs> you know, many years ago, Olati woke up from sleep. Olati can dream. Ah, oh. <laughs> when Olati is telling you the dream, sincerely, it's like Netflix. <laughs> ah, 
Like, <laughs> like she was talking in detail. So she woke me up. This is about uh, 15 years ago now. This one. 15, yeah. About 16, 15 years ago. One, early one morning, she, I woke up and she told me about her, her latte dreams. And then she said, uh, Seku, overnight, I saw that somebody shot you and you died. Yeah? The moment she said that, I knew what it meant. That I was losing my job. No, you, that was just it. That was just it. That's all. <laughs> that was me. No, ah, my husband, you will die. <laughs> <laughs> at, that point, at that point in time, you saw too much. You didn't see well. <laughs> That's not what she said. Here. What I'm saying that, you, you understand? I mean, look, the moment she said uh, 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 somebody pointed a pistol at you and shot you, I didn't straight away that, oh, you're losing that job. It will be taken away from you forcefully. And it will end. I just knew that was what it was. Straight away. Straight. Yeah? So, but. Does it, and I said that to say this. Just imagine that if you saw somebody, somebody being shot. I was like, ah, <laughs> brethren, we have to pray. <laughs> ah, we have to pray, we have to pray, we have to pray, we have to pray. Ah, me, oh, mm, I know you all say we should do what, 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 but me, when I dream, when I dream, ah, <laughs> when I, <laughs> don't elevate your dream above the word. Moreover, me that is, that it's about, you that is about, you will know. Better still, if you don't know the meaning, keep it to yourself. <laughs> do you understand? I'm saying, as you pray, as you give, if you do these things we're saying in this uh, seminar, there'll be supernatural uh, stuff that will just increase in expression. But what do you do? You understand that there's a whole lot that you will see that you need to grow to understand. But what the person needs to know is that you are praying because you love. Don't become the problem. <laughs> Don't become the problem. The, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> Uh, SK, Dele is leaving. Dele, Dele is leaving. Dele is leaving. You didn't even know how to deliver a message. <laughs> Dele, uh, Dele is, uh, where my God shows me. <laughs> Except he doesn't show me. Once he shows me, that's it. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, yeah, 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 so he's leaving, he's leaving. Uh, because you are what? <laughs> now, do you understand? I, I'm saying, look at the detail. Ah, uh, my friend, read Ephesians now. Read Colossians, read Philippians. See the kind of detail Paul told people. Are you supposing that Paul did not see more particular things about the Ephesians, about the Corinthians? Of course he would. The same guy that would say the Spirit tells me expressly in the later times. Uh, you know, who did he write it to? Their pastor. Did you get what I said? The person he told that kind of detail to was their pastor. Now, hmm, you know, Timothy is pastor of Ephesus. Mm, he's not. You know, if you read the book of Ephesians, you will never know that they had doctrinal problem in their midst. It's when you read the book of Timothy. You know, be, eh. So their mouths to be stopped. But he told it to the person that could do something about it. Imagine, we are telling you that mm, in your church, your certain mouths to be stopped and you're not the pastor. What will you do with it? So it's not something to tell you. So it doesn't tell the Ephesians. It tells the, uh, Timothy. Because Timothy can do something about it. I'm saying praying intelligently. Praying intelligently. There's something about recognizing people's fear of influence. That there's an influence that Timothy has. Timothy is the one that can stop mouth. So it's Timothy we tell. And it's now Timothy we now say, ah, Alexander and Humanius. You mention names to Timothy. Names he won't mention in Ephesians. Do you understand? Because that is not the purpose. See, if you mention it to the Ephesians, you will be shaming people. If you mention it to Timothy, you are helping Timothy guard the saints with an opportunity for those two boys to actually recover. Did you get what I said? Yeah? Now, so that's praying intelligently. As someone says, I don't know about that. Oh, but I think I saw it. If I saw it, the reason why God made me see it. I'm a seer. I, I, I'm a seer. I, I have the unction of a seer on me. Hmm. Hmm. I know. <laughs> Again, Relax. Prayer is the ministry of love. We say enough for people to be a help. Prayer is a help, not a hindrance. Amen. Look at 1 Peter. Let me read you something in 1 Peter. Let me read something in 1 Peter. Are you there? Have you gone on? 1 Peter. 
Don't tell me you are about to do what I think you're about to do. Ah, okay, that's it. Ah. Ah. <laughs> One hour already. Eh? Eh. You don't agree, right? I agree with you. I agree with you. Ah. Where were you opening to? Let's reset the clock. I don't know what this. But me, I'm just starting up. What a preamble. <laughs> but anyway, the Lord is sneaky. Amen. Clearly sneaky. It's not good for me there. So, but I will flow with him. Yeah. <laughs> Jehovah sneaky. Jehovah sneaky. It's clearly Jehovah sneaky. <laughs> There's a Hebrew word, sneaky. <laughs> you snuck, snuck up on me there. Well, nah, anyway, first, somebody said, did you just tell him he was sneaky? He's my, he's my savior. <laughs> you say whatever you want to yours. <laughs> now, but understand this, that there is something about us learning to pray intelligently. It's not enough just to understand you see what happens is that in the understanding redemption there's a wisdom that goes with it there's a wisdom I, i'm saying there's something beyond glory you know we're glory drunk people glory glory and the one that you need to say glory about glory glory now i don't have anything against glory <laughs> yeah i'm not saying some people so we think that the aim of revelation knowledge is able to say glory glory you know, whatever. No. But this thing guides us, takes us into prayer. And in prayer, we are particular, intelligent, specific. There's a way that we pray. And that's what I'm looking at. To say that in the church, in the local assembly, as we pray for one another, there will be phenomenal detail, phenomenal detail. There will be things that you will know. Who do you tell those things to? You tell the things to the people that can do something about the things. There are some, I mean, it's like you tell, there are some things you tell my child, my child can do nothing about it. You tell me, then I can do something about it. Amen. There are some other things that you yourself are still growing in on the comprehension of what you saw. But what do we do? We are patient. You're not in a race. You're not in a hurry. Nobody gets a price for who got it quickest. The price is for edification. Who was able to edify people with this stuff? And edification often involves that you have people you discuss these things with. That's what I'm telling you that. How did Paul know about Epaphras' prayer life? They discussed it. And in discussing it, Paul would then know what's on Epaphras' mind. Look at Philemon. Look at Philemon. Are you there? Are you there? Good. Look at Philemon. Philemon. It's on the outskirts of Hebrews. One chapter. Verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our what? Bro. Unto Philemon, our dearly and fellow, and to our beloved appear, and Archippus, and... Did you say Archippus? Which Archippus? What did he now call Archippus? Fellow soldier. Did Epaphras prayer work? What happened after, wait, in between Epaphras' prayer and Archippus being called fellow soldier, what happened? The whole church received the instruction on what to say to Archippus and they stuck with it. Because he told him, he said, say to Archippus that he does what? Take it to the ministry has received in the Lord that he fulfills it. And apparently, Archippus took it. What does that mean? The people that were told did something with what they were told. Now, Paul can now talk about that same act. Do you notice that whenever Paul is writing a letter and your name is at the very beginning, <laughs> your name has entered the book of life. You're all right. You're all right. The people that are not all right are never at the beginning. Yeah. They, they, I'm serious. Read Paul's letter. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's Paul. You are at the beginning. I mean, Archippus is now in verse 2. Archippus that the guy was looking for, how do I learn this message about Archippus in Colossians? 
But now in, did you see the point? Philemon. It says, it says uh, Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved, and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Apia and Archippus, our fellow soldier. He's now calling him fellow. How did Archippus become fellow? Because he took it. How did he take it? Because the saints, as an assembly, everybody said the same thing. Let me say it again. Do you know that when we are not of the same mind, we destroy the effectiveness of our prayers? Although we must not be of the same mind on nonsense. I, I, I'm not for just being on the same mind of same mind's sake. Locate the mind of Christ. Locate the purpose of God. Understand the instruction of the Spirit. Then we all say the same thing. Imagine if when Paul told them to say to Archippus, somebody say, ah, Archippus, <laughs> You can't be like that sickle guy who you just lose your job. Me, my advice to you is face, face your job. Face your job. Face your job. Look, who pays your mortgage? Is it not you? Face your job. What, what about what is ministry received in the Lord? Did you kill Jesus? Uh -uh. There's, always, there's always tomorrow. There's tomorrow. There's always an opportunity to grow later. My friend, face, face your front and do your work. Another person will come and say, ah, I keep us. Don't let, them, don't let them draw you closer. The, the, these guys, <laughs> Peter, see where, see where Paul put your name. You are very close to hell. See where your name is. Don't love them. But no, no, no. The church, it says, say to Archippus. So all of them must have said to Archippus. Wait, wait. Let me tell you something. The greatest, listen carefully. The reason why Archippus was able to go from he should pay heed to ministry to fellow soldier is because a Epaphras prayer for the whole church brought the whole church to one-mindedness. So that the church then told the guy the same thing. Let me tell you something, Pauline. Let's say that Tunde, our choir master, He doesn't like where this is going, so, so don't let me use. But imagine, you know that bro in First Corinthians five that they, that they were to deal with. You know the bro, right? Now that they were to deal with. Imagine while the church was actually disciplining him, the guy just left church. I went to Colossae, and the pastor of Colossae does news bulletin Facebook. Ah, the Lord has increased us. Men are being added daily. <laughs> what has happened? By taking that guy in, they've cut short the spiritual growth. The number increase, but then trouble happens in that church. Why, what is needed is that Colossae and Corinth will be agreed about the guy. But you understand now, how many churches can agree that you are saying the same thing? No? And if one person leaves you to come to our side, Ah, you are too harsh. You are tough. You are hard. Because you are hard. That's why the person left. And some people are tough and hard. And I understand that. You are, you are, but get my point. I'm saying Paul gave instructions. The effectiveness of the instructions was on the church doing it together and the other churches, right, recognizing what was going on in Corinth. If the churches don't, un you know you would tell them, take the letter to Colossae. Read it in Laodicea. Take the one Laodicea, read it in Colossae. Meaning that the churches will know what is going on. Titus will know what is going on in Corinth. Timothy will know. So Titus will take it to Crete. Timothy will take it to Ephesus. So that when somebody is being dealt with in Corinth and he suddenly runs like Jonah and goes to uh, Crete, they will tell him, oh boy, Paul, the guy is here. <laughs> yeah, 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 the guy is here. So that the whole church can say the same thing. Why is it that spiritual growth looks difficult in our day? Is because the whole church doesn't say the same thing. Why can't they say, say the same thing? Remember that first other session I did? Labor has been prayed for. Labor has been prayed for. Look at Hebrews. I'm going to come back to Philemon. Look at Hebrews. Hebrews. I'm talking about prayer in the local church. Praying intelligently. Look, look at Hebrews. Hebrews and chapter 13. Are you there? Hebrews and chapter 13. I'm going to read verse 18, verse 7. Remember them that have what? 
the rule over you, who have spoken unto you what? The word of God. Whose faith, considering the end of their, should you consider the end of your conversation or not? Yes, yeah, so. You don't follow without considering the end. You look at what's in front of you and be like, is this followable? Yeah? But, but when this is an example of the word of God, follow. But watch carefully. Go down to verse 18. The same writer. Verse 18. It says, pray for us. For we trust we have what? A good conscience in all things. So, there's something about praying intelligently for the leaders concerning their conscience. That a man knows the word does not mean he's going to do it. If you don't understand that, you'll be perplexed about things today. That the person knows the word does not mean the person is going to do it. And the person has heard the word does not mean the person is going to act on it. Mode and doctrine, it only merges and comes together when the conscience is right. And concerning the conscience of ministers, the writer of Hebrews said, pray for us. Pray for us. Think about it. Do you know that, how many people did the writer of Hebrews say to pray for? Hebrews 1, 2, 3, 4, just scan it straight in your mind. How many? How many? Hebrews 1, there was no instruction to pray for anybody. 2, no instruction. 3, none. 4, 5. Actually, this way he said it. Pray for us. This praying for us is the brotherly love that is continuing from verse 1. Right? Are you following? Okay. So, how do we best preserve brotherly love at the local assembly? By praying for his leaders. Because when I pray for the leaders of the local assembly, I am praying for influence in the local assembly. A leader can influence the whole church. And there are certain disciples or people in the church that only influence a few people. So if I want to have maximum impact, I pray along the lines of influence. If I wanted to pray for your home, and you are married to somebody and you have kids, I'll focus on you more than your kids. Because you, by your instructions, can invalidate every prayer prayed in that place. But when you are all right, the kids will be all right. But if you are not all right, the kids will not be all right. Even if somebody is praying directly for the kids. The best way to pray for the kids in the family is to pray for the parents in that, in that family. You pray, for the fam you pray for the parents and the parents' decisions will serve the kids. Right? You pray for the pastor and the pastor's instructions will influence the whole church. Let me tell you, if a church is in disarray and you have the opportunity to pray for one, you have to take one thing in prayer, the leaders or the whole church, always take the leader. Pray for us that we trust that we have a good conscience. Because the leader's conscience will be the example that will become the mode that everybody follows. That's praying intelligently. If you got up in the morning, I know you should pray 10 hours in the morning, but let's say you only have 5 minutes. Pray along the lines of authority. Pray along the lines of influence. Because at the end of the day, this is about bringing the maximum impact and benefit to people. Hallelujah. Okay? When you are praying for a group of people, find out the most influential people amongst them, the pillars. Pray for those ones. Then the pillars will influence everybody else. Otherwise, you would think you should pray around the world. Five minutes here, two minutes here, one minute here, three minutes there, two minutes there, five minutes there, and you are, you are dizzy in prayer. Say, ah, I don't have enough time to go around. You always have enough time to go around. It will look like it's not working, but it is working. Pray for us, for we trust that we have a good conscience. You, have, you, are, you are in a cell, a unit, a group in church. You, you belong to a team. Pray for the leadership of a team, and you've prayed for the team. It will look like pray for everybody individually. Look at what Peter, Paul Jesus did. He said, Satan has asked to sift you, but I've prayed for you, Peter. When you are recovered, you will recover your brethren. So, when Jesus was faced with the option of praying for everybody, he chose Peter. Because there is an influence that Peter will have that Jesus will not have when Jesus is not physically present. You did not hear me well. That was in his sleep of tongue. There is an influence that Peter will have that Jesus will not have once Jesus is no longer physically present. Jesus knows that, so he focuses on Peter. Because once you get Peter, you get the rest. 
You play, you pray, sorry, I said play. You pray along the lines of authority. You pray along the lines of influence. I mean, wait. Who is teaching the Ephesians according to the Ephesian letter? Paul. Watch Paul. Paul starts praying for them so that they can pray for him. Because in praying for him, he will have utterance to influence them. Did you see the cycle? He's praying for them. Why? He has, so, he has taught them. Then he prays for them. Then he tells them, I'm praying for you. Then he now tells them, actually, uh, pray with all manner of prayer. And look at Ephesians 6. So, you see the point. Ephesians 6. I, I, I was to talk from First Thessalonians tonight. Jehovah Snakey. Look at Ephesians 6. Amen. Are you in Ephesians 6? Look, go all the way down to verse 16. Above all. Somebody say above all. The guy is rounding up. Above all. Take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the... And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the praying always. With all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching their own too, with all perseverance and supplication for all stop how many sins does paul expect the sins to pray for oh read the next line for all saints for all saints and for me can you see who did he single out huh who did he single out himself for all saints and for me for all saints and for me right why because the me which is paul will be of maximum influence on the saints so it says pray did you see that point it says and for me that utterance maybe notice is particular and for me that what utterance maybe what given to me that i may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in bonds. That therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But that you may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord shall make known to you all things. Okay? Now, this is important. Look at verse 22. Look at verse 22. It says, whom, <laughs> listen carefully, whom I have sent unto for the same that you may know our that you may know our should a congregation know their pastors affairs <laughs> at that point people say seku don't go for that <laughs> i'm saying notice carefully he is telling them in order what he's saying is this my affairs i want you to know <laughs> the guy is a good guy he's a good guy ah no somebody says no 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 that, well, the private life of the pastor depends on the pastor. I'm not even saying private. I'm not saying, look at Peter's heart. I said, Paul. Paul wanted them to know his affairs. He even appointed a minister to tell it to them. <laughs> you understand? Yeah? Let me tell you. Let's say I was sick, ill as a pastor. You know I want everybody in church to know? Yeah? If I was sick, I want every one of you to know. You should know my affairs. How things are with me. Am I okay? Am I not okay? Because that is a way, that is the example I'm setting so that we can all know and be concerned about one another. But when the pastor's territory is unattainable, unassailable, how can the saints pray effectively? Lo I'm talking local church. Local church. Uh, uh, Paul that wants them to pray for him will say, I want you to know. look at it. Ephesians 6 and verse 19. For me, everybody likes the all transparent. All trans will be given all to me. But look, emphasize what the apostles emphasize. Don't stop at all trans. That's the way it stopped. Yeah? It says, for, it says in verse um, 21, but that you may all know, but that you may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother, a faithful minister in the Lord, it shall make known to you all things whom I've sent unto you for the same. In other words, 
Tychicus is the one I've authorized to tell you. Do you get the point? Yeah? So, a local church should know that. Oh, that this person is authorized by a pastor. I mean, if Olati comes forth to say, uh, Seku is uh, uh, quite ill now, you're not going to say, I wonder if she's authorized to say. Do you understand? But, but look at the way church is. Church ought to be a place where there's no mystery. Nothing shrouded in a mystery. Right? Utterance presupposes a people that have an exposure to what is about influence. If the local church cannot pray for his pastor, who can? You know how many times Paul said, pray for us? You know how many times? Pray for us, pray for us, pray for us. That is the, uh, actually, in the epistles, the pastors, the leaders, the apostles, they ask the church to pray for them. Today, it is that the church must come to the pastor for the pastor to pray for them. I'm not saying the pastor shouldn't pray, but I'm saying the pastor should be vulnerable to his congregation to say, you have to pray for us. And he will explain why. I'm in chains. You know what chains means? The guy is in prison. Someone say, ah, no, no, no. Ah, if you tell the congregation that, they will think the power of God will not move. You're on drugs. You, you, you are on koro, koro drugs. Koro, koro. <laughs> ah! No, 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 we have to manage information. Manage information of the saints who are, whose hearts are open to their man. Our man, bro, Paul. <laughs> no, said my affairs, you will know. But notice, it wasn't, every, it wasn't anybody that would say it. Tychicus is a beloved brother. He's a minister. That means the gospel will determine what Tychicus will say. But Tychicus has the parameters to talk about their affairs. The word affairs is a big thing to use these days. <laughs> you understand? But you understand what I mean? Just to talk. I don't know where my message will reach now. When I said affair, it's just like I was talking about his, his well being, the things that happened to him. <laughs> you know, wisdom is directed. You know? so, right? But, but you get the point. I'm saying read the epistles, be intelligent in prayer, be intelligent. Look at the way that Paul introduced prayer. He wants to talk about his affairs. He wants them to know, but he wants them to know with the knowledge of redemption. He wants them to pray. He covets their prayer, but the prayer was about utterance. Funny enough, the prayer was about utterance, and he said, look, my welfare is okay for you guys to know. It's okay. Amen. It's okay. You know, I like church where if stuff is happening, just you guys should just know. You should just know. Praise God. Eh? Well, someone says it's not going to work in my church. Fine. It's going to work here. It's going to work. Why? Why will it work here? All I've got to go by is the apostles and their letters and their writings. How many people knew about the affairs of Moses in Genesis through Deuteronomy? Do you know it's the whole nation? It's the whole nation that Moses wrote those things he wrote to. They could all trace his history. I'm talking about an assembly. That's the way we are. Amen. So amongst us, we have to nurture the sense of family. The sense of family. It's not everybody that will say it. But there are some that will say it. And when the some that should say it are there, they are not shrouding things in mystery. They are talking about the things that are beautiful and important and good and cool. Praise God. Now, so, he said here, he said here, I'm doing okay, Olati. Thank you. Even you are just gentle. Thanks. Thanks. I think it must be the voice I'm using to talk. Yeah? <laughs> it's working. It's working mightily. <laughs> you see, I, I was telling her, I'm telling her my feelings. So that her heart opens and she just says, I should just relax for pastor. Just pull it. It's working. Isn't it? This thing works. <laughs> Amen. So, Cornelius prayed, right? And uh, Cornelius prayed. Don't forget, Cornelius prayed. The prayer of Cornelius influenced Cornelius. And in influencing Cornelius, it affected how Cornelius gathered other people around that were able to receive the ministry of Peter. Let me say it again. The greatest emphasis of our prayers will be people receiving ministry. I did not say that the only things about people's life 
is receiving ministry. Nor have I said that the only thing you can pray about is ministry. But I'm saying by and large, you'll find that the emphasis is on ministry. You know why? Because doctrine is more powerful than many people assume it is. It's actually more powerful than many people assume it is. They are belief systems. You know, the part of the world where uh, uh, Delhi comes from, the, the part of the world where Delhi comes from, you know, family life is broken down by everybody. Once you're a woman and you are older than maybe like 24, 5, before long you're a witch. Yeah. And the revelation that the prophets are always giving every other person is that other person is a witch and the person stole, stole your glory <laughs> imagine but I, I like one of Olati's sisters sincerely she they, they told her that one of the sisters stole their glory and that's what that sister said uh -uh. she can't steal it because my glory is never enough for me <laughs> <laughs> I don't like ah ah oh my just take five I like that Look at, look at that mindset. That, oh, oh, glory that is not even, not even enough for me. <laughs> there is nothing to steal. <laughs> nothing, nothing. You know, she's actually more sane than many people I know. So I'm like, oh, my glory. They're taking it. Oh, no, 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 no. That's, that is, you, you are hyperventilating about nonsense. He, yeah? No, no. Sincerely. <laughs> I'm saying, use your prayer life for ministry to people yeah and we pray in smart ways back to where i was right we, we pray in smart ways this thing looks so they might appear commonsensical but you'll be, you'll be amazed how many people don't know these things and so they get into trouble they get into unnecessary trouble amen they get into look look at first corinthians 7 let me show you something this what i'm about to say now it used to cause trouble when we we're investing in those days yeah, First Corinthians seven. Look at it. <laughs> All that you already knows what. First Corinthians seven. Are you there? It says, verse sixteen. What do you know, O oh wife? Whether you shall save your husband, or how knowest thou, O oh man, whether you shall save your, save your what? What is he calling the husband or the wife the savior of the spouse? No, when he says save there, he's simply talking about, the, Peter explains this better. Peter talks about the fact that, look at Peter quickly, sorry. Look at Peter. I want to say something, but I want you to see it. Look at Peter quickly, First Peter 3, First Peter chapter 3, and verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the, so we're talking about mixed marriage, where one is a believer and the other is not, right? Yeah, so it says here that they also may without the word be won by the what? Conversations of their. So that, that means how will the spouse that is not a believer be affected by the influence that the believer brings? Okay, that is what Paul is talking about when, when he says thou shalt save. So in other words, the influence that the believer will bring will set apart the other spouse to be actually somebody attracted to salvation or pushed away from it are you following okay but verse 17 is where i'm going to but as sorry i am first going to say when i know uh thank you mm. oh 14 14 is where i'm going 14 for the unbelieving husband is sanctified. What is that sanctification again? Influenced by the word so that the word can have its impact. Do you get? Okay. So for the unbelieving husband is what? Sanctified by the. So if you have a family where there's an unbelieving wife and a believing husband, who do you focus the prayer on? The believe, the, whoever is the believer. So if it's unbelieving wife, believing husband, you focus on the, on the husband. If it's unbelieving husband, but believing wife, you focus on the wife. Because that is the influence of God in that home. 
Again, you pray along the lines of influence. Okay? So it says here, are you there? Have I lost you? Verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Sanctified here simply means set apart. What is it that doing is setting apart? The influence that that person brings. So it says in uh, verse uh, uh, 14, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else, look at it carefully, else why your, your what? Children unclean. But now they are what? What does holy mean? It's the same word sanctified. What is it that sanctifies the children? Huh? The believing one. Okay, which one is the believing one? The believing parent. So, if I want to pray for parents and children, generally, I will pick parents. If I want to pick, do you understand? Why? Because inf- that's the direction in which influence flows. Is, so, Paul would say, else were your children unholy, but now they are. In other words, he could say categorically that because of influence and the fact that you or the husband or the wife are going to live by the word, they are living by the word, will be an influence on the children. It's not saying that if you're a Christian, then your children are Christians. No. It's simply saying that if you are walking by the word, if you are submitted to the word of God, then the influence that that person brings can be, will actually be available to change all that come in contact with it. Amen. So if we are praying in such a scenario, we pray along the lines of influence. We pray along the lines of influence. It's extremely important. We pray along the lines of influence because that is the way that things work. Along the lines of influence. Praise God. Along the lines of influence. It's important. Now, let me, let me, show, let me uh, tell you something else uh, because this is important. Uh, if you come back with me, okay, I have about a few minutes. Uh, given where I started, a lot here. Actually, I'm liking what you're doing to me today. Or it's like, I don't even know. I am happy. No, the Lord is making me happy, although I've been sidetracked. <laughs> it's very interesting. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Amen. I, let's go back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew? Are you there? Matthew chapter 5. At least so that I will close at the two hour mark. Let me start saying I'm rounding up. Ma- but, but don't start thinking I'm taking long because my two hours is going to be up in about 20 minutes. But look at, ah, yes, so check your watch. Look at Matthew and chapter 5. Are you there? Matthew 5 and verse 43. You have heard that it has been said, thou shalt love your what? Thou shalt love your what? Thou shalt love your? You shall love your neighbor and do what? And you shall do what to your enemy? It's your enemy. I say to you, love your enemies. Bless. That means speak well of them. That cause you. Do good. What is the blessing? To do good. So the good, the good you do, that is that in the face of hatred, you speak well. Right? And if you are speaking well, where will we see your speech? In prayer. It says, it said, do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. So them that despitefully use you and persecute you, then you shall be the children of your father which is in heaven. So the father in heaven is God that does not practice tit for tat because he makes his reign. To do what? <laughs> it makes his rain to fall on the just and on the, and it makes his sun to shine, to rise on the evil and on the. What is this evil? What is this sun? And what is this rain? Someone said, ah, Seku, don't expound that. Though. I know what the sun is. And I know what the rain is. I know. Let's leave it alone. Well, go to chapter 6. Chapter 6 and verse 9. After, wait, what does the heavenly father do? He makes his son to rise and his rain to fall. Look at Matthew 9. Matthew 9, sorry, Matthew 6, I meant sorry. Matthew 6 verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye. Our father, 
which art in heaven. That's the same terminology in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45. Did you see that? So, what does our Father in heaven do in Matthew 5 45? He maketh the sun, the same sun, to rise on the evil and on the the evil and on the what? And on the good. In other words, God is, is actually indiscriminate. The Bible will say that there's no partiality with him. That's what the Bible describes it. Okay? So, it, it's not one way towards the Christian and another way towards the unbeliever. People want it to be that way. But blessed be God, you're not God. Amen. Now, Matthew 6 and verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven. What is heaven? Unlike earth. What is earth? Hatred, chapter 5. Cursing, chapter 5. Abuse, chapter 5. Right? Persecution, chapter 5. So earth describes the domain of man. Heaven describes the domain of God. So our father in heaven is simply our father who is unlike men that are hate, that are cruel, that are this, yeah? Our father who will meet those kind of men with his own agenda. He will give his son to rise, his reign to fall, uh, independent of the recipient status. Okay? So that father is the one being talked about in Matthew chapter 6 verse 9. Our father which is in heaven, when you're thinking that, don't start thinking of planets. There's nothing planets about all the discussion. What is it talking about when it says uh, our father in heaven? He's describing men interacting with men. Because the people that can hate you are the people that will interact with you. The people that will persecute you are those that will interact with you. The people that will curse you are those that will interact with you. The interaction from their side is cursing. The interaction from their side is hatred. The interaction from their side is abuse. Our father in heaven is father who in his relationships will not do tit for tat. He doesn't do karma. He wouldn't return to sender. So return to sender is not a father concept. It is a man's concept, earth's concept, worldly concept, but not the father. The father will use his mercy to quench that. Men, on the other hand, will return fire for fire, so that they that live by the sword, die by the sword. Now, so it now says in Matthew and chapter 6 verse 9, uh, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed means, is the same word you use for sanctified or holy. It means distinct, separate, in his own category. So our father in heaven, your distinction, your name. What is the person's name? See, the Bible is not a Western book. It's a Middle Eastern book. In the Middle East, and really, of course, when I was a lot younger and I was going to boarding school, my mom will normally call or dad, and then will, most, mostly my mom, really, say, uh, well, remember our name. You know, and when we wanted to be naughty, we would tell my mom that it's, we spell the name. And she, then she would speak in her dialect, her dialect, right? Now, uh, and they say, I remember, you remember the family name? They're not talking about the spelling of the name. They're talking about the reputation, yeah? So a name is a reputation, an accomplishment, a standing, a status. So our father who art in heaven, distinct is your status. Distinct is your reputation. Distinct is your deed. What is his deed? You make your son to rise, independent of the audience. You make your reign to fall, independent of the audience. Or have you gone around before and you can see, if you want to take it as literal, and you see the rain falling, and you say, eh? That is Osama bin Laden. The fun, the sun, no, no, no. The sun is not going to rise. No, it rises. Okay? Now, but really, that's not what he's talking about, by the way. But uh, look at it again. It says in verse, uh, verse uh, 9, Our Father which art in heaven, that means our Father who is not of the earth, our Father who is unlike man, which is your distinction, your reputation. Okay? Now look at verse 10. It says, Your kingdom come. What will be the kingdom of God? The fatherhood of God that we just described is expressed. Your kingdom come. What one more time? Your will be done. Your will be done where? Your will be done on the earth as it is in. So men among themselves will begin to find your own method to be the method they should go with. Is that clear? Okay. Now, what is prayer about? We just read it again. Your, your will be done. What is prayer about? Not your will, but his will getting done. So in other words, prayer is how I allow the Father, unlike man, to be expressed amongst men. 
That's prayer. So the intention of prayer is like the father who is no man's method. Man's method is you hate me, I hate you. You do this to me, I do that to you back. And if you take our chief, we take your, your, the king's grandmother. And if we take our own king's grandmother, we take two kings. Yeah? Now, he says God is not that way. Your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth. Why do we pray? It is that the will of God will be amongst men. Earth there just simply means amongst men. In other words, heaven, which is God's activity, influencing earth, which is man's activity. It's not sky affecting England. Amen? Think about it. Let's say, we, I think we're somewhat educated here. Where will heaven be? You, for example, you remember the earth is like a sphere, or you think it's flat. So let's say, that means if you are in Australia, you're almost hanging upside down, and if you are pointing to heaven, and your heaven is, why are you pointing again? Why are you pointing? Uh, yeah, and if you're in England, where are you pointing? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a confusing mess. Okay, don't let, don't let geography and natural thinking mess you up. The Father, see, God, wait, hold on. Where is God now? Okay, where is he? In us. Okay, is God amongst men? Yes. When Jesus was praying this, where was God? Amongst men, Emmanuel, that's God amongst them. Okay, so God on the earth, but men not copying Jesus. That's what we are praying about. That these men are not copying Jesus. They need to follow this example. So we pray. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Now, so God is still in the midst of men. He indwells you. Amen. Yeah. So your will be done on the earth. Notice that the will of God doesn't just happen. Somebody must do it. Right? Amen. So your will be done on the earth as it is where? Sorry, it will be done in heaven as it is in the? As it is in heaven. You, done in earth as it is in heaven. That means it's the, that is the way you are. It should be that way amongst men. Right? Look at verse 11. What is the will of God? You give us this day our what? Daily bread. You see that word and? That's our beautiful kai. What is he giving to us? What does the heavenly father give? Daily bread. What does he give again? Hold on. Let's see if you have uh, thrown away your Bibles. We were talking about the same heavenly father in chapter 5, right? What does the heavenly father do in chapter 5? His reign and his son. So what is the daily bread? The reign and the son. What he called bread. And he, so what he called the reign. And he called son. He now calls bread. What about that? Okay, hold your hand in that place. Someone say, ah, I don't like, I don't like this. Oh. I don't, don't take away my bread from me. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 33. It says, for the, are you there? Who is giving the bread in Matthew 6? Our Father God. Look at Matthew 6, 30, sorry, John 6, 33. For the bread of, the bread of, <laughs> Verse 33, for the bread of God is, uh, so the bread of God is not made in bakery. The bread of God is a person. So give us this day our daily bread. Who is that bread? Jesus in redemption. Who is the reign of God and the son of God? For Malachi says the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Who is the son of righteousness? Jesus. Amen. Are you there? You don't like that. I like it. John 6, 33. For the bread of God is he, which cometh down from, is he being done in heaven and on the, as on the earth? The bread of God, it comes from where? From, and giveth his life unto the, so what is being done in heaven as on the earth? The giving of his life. Abby? It gives, sorry. It, it gives his life, so, in other words, what is the bread that God gives that where men don't have life, they have that life? The bread of God. Jesus, the bread of God. You know, there is a bread in Bethlehem. Right. Now, 34. 
Then they said unto him, Lord, ever more give us this bread. <laughs> 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall what? So if God gives you bread, living bread, what will happen to you? You never hunger. Let's go over to Matthew 6. Matthew 6. Are you there? Are you in Matthew 6? So Matthew 6 says you are praying. In other words, the aim of our prayer is that that heavenly bread comes to the earth. The giving of his life. So that men will eat and they will never be hungry again. Right? Okay? So, in verse, in verse uh, 10 or 11, give us this day our what? You see that word and in verse 12? That's that word kai. It's a further explanation of what he's talking about. He has not changed. So, that word kai is even, or that is to say. So, you give us this day. So, who has bread? He. Who doesn't have bread? The people he's talking to. Who will give them bread? God. What will then happen? Those that did not have bread now have bread. Also can be said as, in verse 12, forgive us our... What did they have? Debt. What does he give them? Forgiveness. What is the bread? Forgiveness of? Of sins. Somebody says, ah, look at verse 12. Forgive us our debt as we... As we what? Forgive our what? Hold on, hold on. Okay, so if you read that verse 12, and we read it only English, what will we conclude? That when I forgive people, God will then forgive me. Which goes totally against everything we just read. Because all we just read is that it should be on earth as it is in heaven. That we, when we are hated, we should love men. That way we are the children of of father. So who is copying who? We are copying him. Is he, he copying us? So does God say, eh, 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 eh? <laughs> ah, Ogo, you did not forget, forgive SK. I won't forgive you. Wait, wait. Watch carefully. If Ogo not forgiving SK is bad, what will you call God copying Ogo? Yeah? Okay. The other thing is, let me help out. Someone say, ah, they are changing the Bible. Oh, oh, they've come again. These guys are changing the Bible. But hold on. Someone say, but you can't tell me what I don't know. I know what I saw. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Please, does anybody have a Greek concordance here? Strong's? That word as there, what, what does it mean? As, 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 yes. Professor Brings. What does yours say? Huh? Oh, you don't have it then. We are coming. I caught you. You're not in the same verse as me. <laughs> it, it's what? It's Kai. So what should that word be? That is, or even as, so, is it in your own Bible that is even as? It's your concordance that is even as. Is it there? Blue letter. Which one is it? What, what does it say? Even. Good. Okay. Let's read it well then. Verse 12. And forgive us our debts, even we, uh, even as we forgive our debtors. Or, read on, read on. Bring it, bring it on, bring it on. No, now, as you. No, read on um, the meaning of the word as. Likewise, oh, go on. So, did somebody see so? Is there? Let's put so there now. Because if you put even, it doesn't change it. Look at verse 12. And forgive us our debts, so we forgive our debtors. Does that read well? So, it should be so. So, he forgives us, heaven. We forgive others, earth. So, wait, wait, what is he teaching about? Look at verse 9. You're correct. Verse 9, verse 9. You are correct, by the way. What does verse 9 say? When you 
pray or pray after this manner. So why is he teaching them to pray? So that they can be like their father in that they will do what? Forgive others. So the purpose of prayer in our relationships is to practice forgiveness. Good stuff. Yeah? Go to Mark 11. Mark 11. My assistant pastor Topper is on the same page, eh? Mark 11. Mark 11. Mark 11. I'm going to read verse 23. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall see unto this mountain be thou more removed than cast into the sea. I shall not doubt in his life, but shall believe that those things which shall come to pass shall have whatsoever I say it. Verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, what is whatsoever is that when you believe, uh, yeah? when you pray, believe that you, you know, my origin used to be, I used to be very friendly with uh, something long ago. It says, therefore I say unto you, what things whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall what? Uh, verse 25. And when you stand, what should you do? Hold on. What did Jesus teach them in Mark 11? Prayer should be a, with what in mind? Forgiveness. So, you enter into prayer in order to forgive. The target of prayer is that the man praying will forgive whoever he has anything against. So, the moment you are praying, Shoko Haravate, you are just forgiving people. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Papa, nothing. I forgive. I let go. Oh, excuse me. Oh, no, no. It's part of our Bible. I love her. No. I just let go. Right? Now. So, the aim, watch, the aim of prayer is so that you forgive. We've seen it in Matthew 6. We've seen it in Mark 11. Look at, uh, look at uh, James. Okay, now let me ask it a bit differently. What is the rank that God gives to the just and the unjust? Forgiveness. Okay, good. And we all agreed now. <laughs> Pastor Seku, no, you, you cornered us into saying it. That's not really what I wanted to say. <laughs> Where did I say she opened to? James. Okay, I have two minutes, and then I stop. In fact, I'll let you, I'm even finishing before two hours. How good is that? God is a good God. James 5, verse 16. Confess. Uh -uh. Read it now. Verse 16. Con confess your one to. Who is confessing what to who? Man to man is confessing fault. Right? Good. So, in our relationships, what do we do to one another? The word confess there is the Greek ex homologio. It simply means, I just told you what it was for a reason. I mean, I've talked about three hours without saying it again. But it's to say, it means to say something out publicly. To say out publicly. Whereas homologio is to agree. So what he's talking about here is no agreement. It's to say out. That means me that I know that I have a fault that I've done to you. I say it out for you to hear. Anyway, notice who. I don't have a fault towards Tokwe, and I go and tell Alati. Trouble normally, it's called, there's a G word for it. So, James 5, 16, it says, where are we? Confess your faults to one another, and do what? Pray for, who are the people praying for one another? The people that are confessing their faults to one another. If there is a fault between you and I, it means there's a problem in our relationship. So, praying, what are we doing now doing? Pray for one another that what? What is getting healed? Your relationship. Did you notice again? What has just happened? We have forgiven one another. Prayer is with forgiveness in mind in relationships. In fact, read the verse before. Read the verse before. Read the verse before. Yeah, 15. And the prayer of faith shall save thee, and the Lord shall raise him up. What does the Lord do to the man? Raises him up. Now, let's be done. If he has committed what sins? The fault in verse 16. If he has committed any sins, they shall be. Who is going to forgive him? Who is going to forgive him? The other Pelzi. <laughs> yeah, the other Pelzi. <laughs> yes. I'm going to throw a kitchen sink and everything at you. The other Pelzi. <laughs> right? So he said, so the person, notice, oh, when he talked about healing, he said the Lord will raise him up. 
When it came to forgiveness, notice, look at the way it's crafted. They shall be forgiven him. It didn't tell you who. It didn't tell you that he's the Lord. It just said they shall be forgiven him. Who is doing the forgiveness? Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. So how do we, st- but let's read on, let's read on. Verse uh, 18, and he prayed again. I'm going to skip Elijah, but you get the point. Pray, if any of you do, what is the error? False. The false that they had. If any of you do err uh, from the truth, because you have to abandon the truth to walk in false. He says, and one converts him. How do you convert him? By forgiving him. And what converts him? Let him know that he which converted the sinner, that means the person that's done wrong, right? From the error of his, shall have saved a soul from Kai. That is to say, he shall hide a multitude of sins. Forgiveness. So what does forgiveness do? It makes you hide sins that other people have committed against you from your own view. So that when you relate to them, you don't see their faults. You see the fact that there's a restoration between us. Where does that start from? Pray one for another. So in our relationships, the intention of prayer is that the man that prays will take prayer as a trigger to forgive. So the man praying finds it easier to forgive. So it is antithetical, opposite, oxymoron, right? For a believer to become more ardent in unforgiveness and be given to prayer. Because the aim of prayer is to practice love. And in love, you are actually releasing those that you are holding something against. Amen. Hold on. When I hold something against you and I let it go, who is helped? Who is helped? Forgiveness is love. Oh. Wait, wait. When God forgives you, who is helped? You. When you forgive, when I forgive you, who is helped? You. Why? Then we're able to relate well. Yeah? If I don't forgive you, then our relationship is tarnished. Look at 1 Peter 3. Sorry, sorry, James. 1 Peter 3. Likewise, verse 7, verse 7. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with your wives according to, verse 7. According to what? Giving, what is the, what is the knowledge a husband should have towards the wife? To give honor. Honor unto the wife as unto the what? Wicker vessel. And as being heirs together of the what? That your what? Prayers be not. Whose prayers? Of husband and? Because a husband and wife that are in a fight cannot pray together. Amen? If they are fighting, if they are not dwelling with each other according to knowledge, in a fight, now they can't pray together. Yeah? Their disagreements will cancel out their prayers. Amen? It's not, it's not saying that God is not going to say, eh? I'm the fight counter. <laughs> ah! You are fighting and you want to talk to me. What kind of use their spells in? No. <laughs> that's not the that's not, that's, that's not the way. That, that who did this to me tonight? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. We know. Yeah. Yes. She she's been talking all the while I was ministry. Yeah. But you get the point. The aim. So when I practice forgiveness, I free up my prayer life so that the people that would normally not make prayer partners can become prayer partners. Hmm. It's not saying that God will not begin to hold you against you and say, eh, you are fighting. And you want me to answer you? No. Because God does not find such a fault. Is that you will not make them a prayer partner. So you will not be able to do the things together that you are meant to do together. But praise God. Well, you guys have been a phenomenal bunch. We've done a couple of hours today. Yeah. We've done a couple of hours today. And we will continue tomorrow at 10 o'clock. What time? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock be here. And um, please, if you are here tonight and you have not yet registered your you have not yet registered your car, please be sure to register your car. Once again, guys, really phenomenal attention from you guys. And Olati, I finished at about two hours. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs>